Join us now for Education Matters, a weekly look at the real people and real stories in education across North Carolina. Welcome to Education Matters, presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm Keith Poston. The North Carolina General Assembly may have stripped the North Carolina State Board of Education of much of its power following the November 2016 election, but a new chairman and several new board members appointed by Governor Roy Cooper are charting their own path and priorities for education in our state. This week, we talked to that new chairman, Eric Davis, and two of the newest board members about where they are focusing their attention. Before we tackle our main topics, we open with our headlines, a quick scan of education headlines across North Carolina and the U.S. While a couple of races across the state remain unsettled, Democrats in North Carolina have already accomplished one of their goals for the midterm election by breaking the three-fifths Republican supermajority in the General Assembly. The veto-proof majority Republicans have held since 2012 effectively gave them free reign in crafting and passing legislation without any Democratic support. With Democratic Governor Roy Cooper, the veto will now carry more weight, and Democrats hope that leads to a more, comp for more compromise and influence over legislation. Many observers, including Governor Cooper, credit the engagement of teachers and the NCAA, which organized May's teacher mark, for helping break the supermajority. A new study by the Brooking Institution found increasing investments in school resource officers in North Carolina did not lead to safer schools. With school safety getting much more focus in the wake of several school shootings, including recently in Charlotte, SROs have been the focus of new legislative funding. The study found that some students felt safer with SROs around, but the actual number of violent incidents was unchanged. And at the same time, females, African-American students, and students who have experienced fights, bullying, or religious teasing reported feeling less safe in schools, even though SROs were present. Finally, a new federal report found that high schools with concentrated poverty are less likely than low poverty schools to offer coursework that students need to get into four-year colleges and succeed. High, schools, um, high poverty schools were defined in this study as having free or reduced price meal rates of at least 75%. The study found that these schools are less likely to offer calculus and physics and less likely to offer advanced placement courses and access to dual enrollment in high school and college classes. Remember, you can visit the Public School Forum's website at ncforum.org, click on Education Matters, and read more about each of these headlines as well as the other topics we cover each week. As I said at the top of the show, the State Board of Education has a brand new chairman and several new members, and we're fortunate to have some of them joining us this week. First up is the newly elected chairman of the State Board, Eric Davis. Eric, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Just for our viewers, a little background on, on um, Eric Davis. He is a Charlotte native, a West Point graduate, and uh, you have been working for Wells Fargo now for, well, I guess, almost 20 years? That's right, yeah. and, uh, and a graduate of North Carolina Public Schools. There you go. Well, that, And that's important in your role as the chair of the State Board of Education. Well, let's talk about that role of the State Board. Now, obviously, you've been on the board during these last couple of years. There's been a lot of, I mean, let's, let's be honest, been a fair amount of sort of turmoil, a little bit of uh, acrimony. The, the, the General Assembly passed legislation that took away a lot of power. There was a lawsuit. The Supreme Court ultimately ruled that those issues are, are, are settled, more or less. But um, I guess now, as the new chairman, you replaced uh, Bill Kobe. Um, do you think that the State Board and Superintendent Johnson can, can kind of put those things behind you and work together? Well, Keith, um, I have the utmost respect for the Office of the State Superintendent, and in uh, my time I've had the good fortune to work with a number of superintendents, both local and state, who are skilled at working with their board for the best interest of their students. And the fact is the system can only be as successful as the superintendent is successful. So our board is committed to working in an open and collaborative way with the superintendent. And in doing so, we respect the superintendent's role to manage the day-to-day -day affairs of the department. And we will, at the same time, execute our roles in terms of overseeing his management of the agency and our policy-making authority. Now, from time to time, that will likely create challenging but professional conversations that we will have in the public spectrum because the board must do its uh, work in the public spectrum. But I'm confident that moving forward in January, we'll keep 
the best interest of our students in mind. Well, it's, it's, that's actually, the, you, you mentioned about sort of oversight and policy. That was actually one of my questions was when you think about the role of the State Board of Education vis-a-vis -vis the uh, state superintendent, I mean, are you partners or are you, uh, or are you more of a watchdog oversight? Or both. Well, in, in my opinion, in the best interest of our students, we're partners, and it's a collaborative teamwork relationship. But unfortunately, the recent events have have changed that relationship and caused it to evolve. But we will endeavor to work as partners and collaborators, ensuring open communication and participation between the board and the superintendent um, in order to uh, do what's right for our students. All right, so we're going to be we're heading in. There will be a special session in a couple of weeks, but the, we're really looking, I guess, from from overall where education funding and policy happens in the long session next year and starting in January. So, so what are the state boards and what are you as chairman? What are your priorities moving into twenty the twenty nineteen legislative session? Sure. So, at our last meeting, we approved a legislative agenda and and a board a budget expansion request, which. We did so in collaboration with the state superintendent and his staff. So we're making one submittal this year. So that's progress in and of itself. And that but, didn't happen last year. No, it did not. And that, and that was more of a historical. That, well, that's 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 that is a. So a, I think that's a sim, more than a symbolic measure. That that's a demonstration that that uh, we're moving forward together. The most or the largest element of that request is about $70 million in additional school support personnel, school nurses, counselors, psychologists, school resource officers, and so mm -hmm. forth. And, and that's a good first step. But in fact, it will take us 10 years to get to the national average wow. in those positions if we continue at that pace. So we're going to need to take that first step as a state this year and then accelerate the progress this year. As your headlines uh, indicated, our students are coming to us each day with greater issues, greater demands. Uh, we need more support for our students and teachers. And, and I think we ought to consider this school nurse in, as an investment, not as a cost. In fact, a recent study showed that, that if we had school nurses at the level of the national average, it would save on average 30 minutes per day for our teachers and over an hour per day with our assistant principals so that they could focus on educating our students, yeah. not having to uh, to support their needs. Yeah, we had, you know we took our cameras down to the uh, to the teacher mart just to kind of talk to the teachers. Why are you here? And um, um, very few of them talked about teacher pay. They actually talked about those kinds of things. They talked about school resources and supports within the school that they thought that they didn't they didn't have as much support as they needed or that they even used to have. Across the state, the number one thing we hear from superintendents running districts is the social, emotional, and mental health to their students are the primary factors inhibiting their education. And those are burdens that are placed on our principals and teachers each day that when, when our students come to school. We need as a state to do a better job of caring for our students when they're out of school and prior to them coming to school so that they come better prepared for our teachers. All right, let me ask you a shift gears. We, uh, uh, you had the, at your last meeting, you had a, uh, a fairly spirited discussion about the innovative school district and the, uh, uh, the, the, the decision to possibly add Carver Heights um, Elementary School uh, into the ISD. It was delayed. Um, and, uh, the, the, the board voted to push that decision until it's in a, in a, in a few weeks. What, were the, what are you doing now as chairman, as the board, to, I guess, to inform your decision uh, for, your, for your final decision in December? Well, the Innovative School District highlights a trend across our state. If you look at the schools that were considered and the schools selected last year, the communities that those schools are in have certain common traits and characteristics. Declining population, decreasing enrollment, high concentrations of poverty, typically inadequate health care, difficulties in nutrition, uh, just a common thread of challenges before the students ever get to school. And so the innovative school district, if it's going to be a reform model going forward, is, needs to be part of a comprehensive effort by our state to deal with those underlying issues that inhibit our students' ability to succeed at school. In terms of the innovative school district itself, um, I think there's opportunities to improve that policy. For instance, if the innovative school district um, put the punitive transfer provision secondary and was primarily a partner to school districts, partner in the way of bringing effective strategies to turn around schools, but also uh, a, a push mm -hmm. of oversight and management urgency 
to help districts make those difficult and often unpopular decisions that are necessary in order to turn schools around and then hold in reserve and use selectively the transfer provision, I think that would be a more effective policy. Well, that makes, Having, that makes, that makes a lot of sense, and, I, and I'm definitely, I want to talk to, we're going to keep following this issue, and I want to talk to our next guest a little bit more about it, but I'm, unfortunately, we're out of time right now. Uh, but thank you so much, Eric, for being here today. We look forward to having you on at another time. My pleasure. Thanks so much. When we come back, we're going to be joined by two of the newest members of the State Board of Education, James Ford and J.B. Buxton. But before you, we go to break, see if you can answer this question. True or false, the first task of the State Board of, of Education after it was formally established was to rebuild the system of schools after the Civil War. Education Matters is brought to you each week in part by Paragon Bank, serving others, enriching lives. Welcome back to Education Matters. Did you correctly answer true? The state constitution that was adopted in 1868 established the first official State Board of Education and its first task was to rebuild the war-torn system of North Carolina public schools after the Civil War. We're going to continue our discussion about the new State Board of Education with two of its newest members. We have joining us James E. Ford of Charlotte, former North Carolina Teacher of the Year, now running his own uh, consulting business focused on equity issues. So, Welcome back to the show, James. Good to be here again. And uh, uh, a friend of the show, uh, J.B. Buxton. Uh, J.B. is uh, here from Raleigh. He's a member at large of the State Board of Education. Recently appointed, I should mention, James is of the Southwest Education Region of the State Board of Education. Again, so thank you and congratulations on your appointment. I, um, thank you. Um, what I wanted to ask you about first, and I'm, actually I'm going to start with you, James. Um, how do you see your role um, like going into this, I, you know, I, you had your very first meeting, and, and anyone who knows you, um, you, you didn't, you weren't quiet, um, <laughs> which is good. Um, so tell me what, how you see your role. Uh, what does James Ford want to be on the State Board of Education? I think, well, in addition to uh, working in, in, in unison uh, with my fellow board members, um, is you know. I, I'm beating the same drum, right, and have for a long time, which is just trying to find ways to equalize opportunity for all kids. And when I talk about equity, obviously I talk about race, but I'm talking about socioeconomic, I'm talking about uh, linguistic diversity, I'm talking about you know the differences uh, in education opportunity for kids in, in rural North Carolina versus urban. Um, just working with the populations that we know are often underserved and, and overlooked, and that's kind of my heart. Right. Now, JB, I mentioned James was former Teacher of the Year. I didn't give you a little bit of a plug. You've been you've been working in education policy uh, for decades. You call me old. I'm calling you old, a little bit old. <laughs> uh, well, I guess we you actually we could, we'll say 20 plus years. How about that? That's good. Uh, and, but including, you were Deputy State Superintendent um, of Public Instruction. So a role which you had significant interaction with the State Board of Education. So, you know, the conversation I just had with Chairman Davis, you've you kind of been on both sides of that now. You're now sitting on the State Board. So how do you see, look, there's undeniable tension. I mean, there's been tension between uh, the, the, the State Board. I mean, Bill Kobe resigned. I mean, I think it was pretty clear that, you know, it was sort of, it was time for him. He's like, I've had what I want to do. How do you hope these to, to bridge these divides? You think your experience um, being on the other side can help? Well, first, I, I just want to say how great it is to have James Ford on this board. I mean, to have his perspective from the classroom and what he's sure. done with schools across the state and nationally is outstanding. So I'm appreciative of the governor's confidence in him and his accepting that appointment. Uh, and it's great to have him next to me here. I, I will tell you that as I sit at that state board table, I do think about the time when I sat on the other side of the table. We're a strategic body. I mean, our role is to be strategic about the direction and focus of the system in the public school system and to manage the efforts of the department against that strategy to support the improvement of education in the state and to support the educational performance of kids. We don't operate the state department. We don't run schools. We don't run districts. We support their capacity to do the right thing for their educators and the right thing for kids. So I see myself and my colleagues as sitting in a strategic role. We can 
move the system to best support the capacity of our districts and schools to do the jobs we need them to do in their communities for kids. All right. Um, I want to go back to your, uh, your James, your comments about equity. I understand, I know that the state board just had a, a planning, I guess a retreat, or at least a meeting before the public meeting, and one and part of that um, was a pretty intensive um, uh, focus on race and equity. Sort of tell me uh, more about the board's goals that you see related to, to, to those issues. Well, I think under the leadership of Chairman Davis, um, we've been pretty forthright in, in acknowledging that there are all sorts of different breaking points and that for us to ignore issues of race, uh, for us not to really be firmly grounded and build up the, uh, the knowledge base around these issues, and not just how they impact our sector, but how they impact all of the sectors, so that it's, you know, uh, we can't just talk about achievement without talking about the gaps and opportunities. So for us, it's about, uh, one, us getting to know each other a little bit better, but also exploring as a group, and as JB mentioned, being strategic about how we uh, diagnose problems and how we administer interventions in ways that acknowledge all of the underlying factors that really just culminate inside the classroom. So I think race is a very firm foundation to start on. We see it in just about every other aspect of society. But we're going to continue to talk about these things because, you know, education is not divorced from the other societal and political reality. Right. J.B., do you think, the, I mean, does the board and, and really the education, I mean, leadership, governance structure, are there blind spots that I think that, that, that our state needs to work on in terms of maybe things they're not seeing or don't understand yet? In the equity context. Sure. Uh, I think an understanding of the department's role in building capacity in districts and schools is a blind spot right now. I mean, what I see coming back into the state government is a serious atrophy of the ability of the department and the state to support low-performing districts right. and schools. And when we think about all the issues that play out that James just talked about, the ability of the state to provide strategic support uh, I think we got a lot of rebuilding to do. Yeah, I mean, look, I just talked to a, a superintendent just yesterday, and they made a similar comment. They said, we just, we feel like we just, at this point, we're going in on our own. Um, that they're, they don't see, um, I mean, it's about I mean, some of the supports. I mean, they're, they're in a transition. I mean, to be fair sure. yeah, they were to Superintendent Johnson and his team, I mean, I, I just met with a deputy state superintendent, said the same thing. They're in a transition. But that's a, that's a good point. All right, let me ask you about ISD. Um, I think, I believe both of you voted to uh, sort of delay the, uh, mm -hmm. the decision to vote. What are your concerns? And I guess, you know, one of my questions, I didn't, I didn't ask Chairman Davis, but there's a, there's a good chance you're going to get to this vote in December and the, the superintendent, the school system, um, the county commission, the teachers are all going to say, we don't want this. And you're going to be, I mean, do you still vote to movement of the ISD? Well, my concerns to your original question is uh, about process. Um, as I mentioned, I'm coming into this. I know what the law is, uh, and I think that, frankly, I think that you know, Dr. Hale and, and Ms. Smith are kind of hamstrung a little bit with the process and some of the confines and the timelines. Uh, but what I know about any um, sort of intervention that's you know supposed to be community supported is that you have to take time to really build. Um, you know, build responsiveness with that community and be able to hear and adhere to the concerns and, and not be put upon, and particularly the populations we're talking about. And that's something I lifted. Uh, low income populations, communities of color, uh, this is not their first time at the rodeo. And so I just had concerns about the way that it's being deployed and then also the information that's informing that. I mean, I, we're strategic and so that takes a lot of information and I didn't, I don't feel like I got enough of that uh, in that initial meeting to make a, to make a decision. Yeah, I and mean, we're, we're, we're running short time, but sure. what do you think, JB? I mean, you think you, you, well, you, you guys get some more info? We, um, we got, I think we have two issues. One is I just don't think we had the data we needed at that meeting to make that decision. We had a lot of data about Carver. We had five other schools on the board, so to speak, that we need to know more about. Are Carver's children the one most in need if we've got to have one by law that's going to be in the ISD? But I think it, it actually points to a much bigger issue. We had five other schools that clearly need some level of support and coaching and assistance. We had eight other schools that were taken off that list for various reasons that had nothing to do with their not needing support. We've got almost 400. What are we doing beyond the one that goes in the ISD? Right. That's a much bigger conversation that we've got to face head on, I think. And it's a much bigger conversation, unfortunately, than we have time for today. We need to have you both back because there's a lot to talk about. But JB, James, good to see you both, and thanks for being here. Thank Appreciate you. you. After the break, this week's Leadership Spotlight.
Each week, Education Matters spotlights individuals demonstrating exceptional leadership in education in North Carolina based on nominations from you, our viewers. This week, we spotlight the Duke Star Program. Leadership Spotlight is brought to you by Participate, where we believe every student deserves equitable access to quality education. The Duke Summer Training and Academic Research Program really aims to introduce people to clinical research. They are high school students and college students, uh, and we take a few teachers as well. We really aim to get students uh, and teachers from the local community and surrounding communities, and we also have an emphasis to make sure that we get underrepresented minorities in medicine and, and healthcare. The purpose really is to make sure that we are showing um, these students like various scientific backgrounds, various um, opportunities that they have kind of going forward. They are learning each day about different aspects of clinical research. They would learn about doing literature searches, data analysis, so they would learn some about st statistical analyses and um, the things that are involved in looking at data and how to interpret the data. As I was in the STAR program and learning about the different career field you could take. I learned basically about myself, what I was interested in, what I wasn't interested in. Being around these babies and these families and seeing all the work that goes into it and all the reward that goes into it, I realized this is actually one of my passions and one of the things I find beautiful in life. So and it genuinely did change my life because I feel like without the STAR program I would have approached a career that I didn't have much passion for. The program kind of culminates in a project that is a paper. It's a manuscript that they that would later be submitted to a journal. Something I'm particularly proud of is that we'll have you know females that'll come in and say, I'm not really sure that I could do this. Like I don't really know what it means to be a doctor or if I can be a doctor and be a mom and be, you know, have personal interaction with these kids to let them know like Actually, it's possible, like this is a path that I took and it's something that you can also take. We'll have kids that have come in and they've never really, I mean, they like science, but they've never thought about maybe a career in medicine. A lot of them will come away thinking, you know what, this is actually something that I can do. People really get to see like there are people living and breathing and doing things that they might have dreamed of and didn't think was possible. They actually are possible. If you know someone or a program that deserves to be recognized, please visit our website, ncforum.org, and click on Education Matters, and you'll find a link to nominate someone in your community. After the break, this week's final word. The recent elections will mean a new look for the General Assembly when it convenes in January. While Republicans maintained their majority at the legislature, Democrats did successfully break the supermajority in the chambers. In the recent past, vetoes from both Republican Governor Pat McCrory and Democratic Governor Roy Cooper were essentially meaningless. Republicans really didn't need to work with Democrats to advance their legislative agenda on education or anything else for that matter. With the new General Assembly, vetoes by Governor Cooper can no longer be automatically overridden, so Republicans will need at least some Democratic votes for their legislation to become law. That includes the state budget, where all the big ticket education items are, such as teacher pay, classroom supports, teacher assistance, private school voucher funding, they all reside there. Now, we've seen what it looks like when there is no bipartisan cooperation on education. A bill passed in a special session after the November 2016 election stripped power from the State Board of Education, a move that led to basically two years of dysfunction and lawsuits where the priority seemed to be anything but students. And now there's a lame duck session set to begin before the newly elected Democratic members are sworn in, paving the way for similar legislative actions to take place. Now, Education used to be a shared priority in the state. In the weeks before the election, we actually saw what it looks like when we put students first, with bipartisan efforts to help our schools and communities recover from Hurricane Florence. Perhaps this more balanced General Assembly will at least force folks to work together, and maybe, just maybe, they'll remember how much they can accomplish when they do. That's it for this week's show. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.